is Hess versus Patrick. Mary, do we know if Ms. Ms. Worthington is here? What's that? Oh. That wasn't her, but just, I was, a lady just went out a minute ago. Was that her, for chance? Um, Let me go look. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind checking, Mr. McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Dong, for uh, finding Ms. Worthington for us. May it please the court. I'm Lisa Worthington, and I represent the appellants in this matter who were the plaintiffs below. This case involves the Florida Enforcement of Foreign Judgments Act, um, which I'm going to call FEFJA which provides a statutory, convenient, and economical way to domesticate a foreign judgment in Florida without having to go through the process of filing a common law action on a judgment. This case presents an issue of first impression for this court. At the outset of this appeal, it was a first impression, a uh, case of first impression for the entire state. But three weeks ago, <coughs> the uh, First District Court of Appeal came down and answered the question, which is, what statute of limitations do you apply to a foreign judgment after it's been properly registered under FEFJA? The First District said that because of the plain wording of the statute, which requires that judgments recorded under FEFJA be treated as if they were, had been entered by Florida courts, the first district in Desert Palace versus Wiley said, <clears throat> we have to apply Florida law because that's what the statute says we must do. Are the terms registering and recording interchangeable? They are. There's At least I've been using used them both. that way, yes. And they registered the judgment in this particular case. They did, and there's no question but that that was valid. And your argument is simply by registering this judgment in Florida, it then becomes tantamount to a Florida judgment which enjoys the 20-year statute of limitations. That's correct, Judge Sleep. And as opposed to if I was, if uh, your client were to bring an action on a judgment, you'd be subject to a five-year statute of limitations from the date of the foreign judgment. Is that correct? That's also correct, Judge Sleep. Although we're talking about different, st uh, different timing for the statute of limitations. The five-year statute of limitations for the filing of an action on a foreign judgment is at the beginning. So uh, you've got five years from the date your foreign judgment was entered to file an action on that judgment in Florida. Once you do that, when you're successful, you get a brand new Florida judgment with a new 20-year statute of limitations. Under FEFJA, as the Michael versus Valley Trucking case said, the only limitation on registering or recording a judgment under FEFJA is that the judgment still be enforceable in the rendering state. Once you record or register the judgment under FEFJA, what the statute itself says is it must be, uh, it has the same effect and must be enforced as if it had been entered by a Florida court. And the first DCA relying on that language has held that in fact, after being registered, a uh, foreign judgment registered under FEFJA does in fact enjoy the 20-year statute of limitations measured from the date of its entry. 
not the date of its registration in Florida, but the date of its entry in the original jurisdiction. Help, help me try to resolve something in my mind. Using a 20-year statute, I guess, provides for uniformity and certainty if I'm checking the property records. Yes. But if full faith and credit is to allow a sister state's orders or judgments to have vitality in another state, when I, if I adopt a 20-year rule, I am giving more full faith and credit than the originating state would otherwise provide. How, uh, help me reconcile that tension. Well, in fact, that's an argument that the appellees made, and that's the, that's a, a, a rule that the trial court relied on. But in fact, there's no authority for that statement. There's no authority in the country that full faith and credit includes as the effect of the judgment the statute of limitations. All of the case law says that what you get, what, what is, what is uh, unassailable in a judgment under full faith and credit is its nature, its finality, its validity. What all the case law says is, and what the United States Supreme Court says, is that forum states can apply their own statutes of limitations to foreign judgments as long as they treat all those judgments the same. Now, the way most cases or most states deal with this under FEFJA and the way the federal courts have always dealt with it under 28 U.S.C. 1963 is to treat all judgments as if they were the judgments of the forum state. And all of the case law says, and there is not a single case to the contrary, that states are Permiss they're permitted to do that. Now, if, if after I file it or record it, whatever you want to call it, in Florida, I find out there are assets in Mississippi, do I, can I take my Florida filing and bring it to Mississippi? You can if it is still, um, you can if it is still, well, well let's, let's, let's make sure that we've got the whole hypothetical going. Let's say you have the five um, years has the five years has has passed in Ar in Arizona. In Arizona, I've got. You've got I, your I'm 20. into 15 oh. years left. I find assets in Mississippi. Can I bring it to Miss? Can I bring my Florida filing to Mississippi, and I could get a lien on assets there? Not without doing something else first. Okay. Now, what the first DCA, the, the facts in the first DCA case, Desert Palace versus Wiley, in fact, were very similar to your hypothetical. They had an, a judgment that originated in Nevada. They had tried to, they were trying to enforce it in Florida. Time was running out. And they, in that case, they actually brought a new action on, on their foreign judgment. They would have, they ended up with, or they were supposed to end up with a new Florida judgment. They would have been able to take that judgment to another but that's state. A, that's a new, that's a that's common exactly law. Right. That's exactly right, and that's not this case. Okay. Here, if uh, Dr. Patrick moves his assets to another state, the, the, um, he, he's, the, the uh, Hesses are outside of the five-year statute of limitations for bringing an action on their foreign judgment. Their judgment is not enforceable in Arizona anymore. They're simply out of luck. Okay. So if they can't collect from him in Florida, Within 20 years from the date their judgment was entered in Arizona, they're out of luck. Okay, they, they, they just can't sharp shop this filing in each of the 50 states where there may be assets. Absolutely not. And in fact, there's a case on it out of, I think, Kansas, the Tanner case, where they, in fact, the creditor tried to do just that. They had a Kansas judgment, they recorded it under uh, Missouri's version of. UFJA, and then they tried to say that that was a new Missouri judgment that they could then re-record in, in Kansas, and that's just not true. But, but under the statute, as I under, understand it, this doesn't, whatever happened in Arizona never becomes a Florida judgment. It, it is just for convenience. Uh, the, the, the Arizona judgment sort of just gets into the public records. It, it, it is not a common law device of domesticating a judgment. 
It's, it's not the common law action. And the difference is that instead of getting a brand new Florida judgment with a brand new statute of limitations, what you get is a judgment that for all purposes is to be treated as if it were entered by a Florida court. Then why would you even do an action on a judgment? Because an action on a judgment obtains a new Florida judgment which enjoys the 20 year statute of limitations. What you're saying is you can just simply record it, I get the 20 year statute of limitations. But Judge Sleet, you only get 20 years from the date of your judgment. And the longer ago that was, the less time you have to enforce it in Florida. I'll give you a concrete example. Let's say you've got a judgment from New Mexico, which has a 14 year statute of limitations and you can't renew it. Let's say that you've been pursuing your debtor in New Mexico and he doesn't have any assets there. Let's say that towards the end of that judgment, maybe even in year 14, he moves to Florida. If you go after him in Florida and all you do is register your judgment under FEFCHA, you only have six more years, right? 14 plus six equals 20 to pursue him in Florida. And as you can see from this case, that might not be enough. I mean, we've been at it now since 2006 and we're still not there. So instead, your judgment creditor can file an action on that judgment and he's going to be within the five year limitation because the debtor just moved here. So the statute is told. And what he ends up with then is a new Florida judgment and 20, not six years, to get it enforced in Florida. That's why you still have that option. I have a concern about the first district court of appeal opinion in Desert Palace, which relies on the NAD case, which was really an interpretation of the Uniform Out of Country Foreign Money Judgment Recognition Act dealing with foreign countries. And they go on to cite that NAD has extended those claims to FEFCHA and they only cite the Goodwin Florida bankruptcy court case, but there's no discussion of the, for lack of pronunciation, the HIAGH case. I call that HAY. HAY, HAY. Well, HAY specifically holds registration of and proceedings to enforce a foreign judgment are derivative of the original judgment are therefore subject to the limitations periods in the jurisdiction where the judgment was originally rendered. That is a pretty clear holding for FEFCHA, as opposed to an aside by the Supreme Court in the NAD case. So I'm just concerned because there is a Florida appellate court opinion that specifically holds that there's a difference between recording or registering versus action on a judgment. And recording and registering, you're subject to the originating state statute of limitations. With respect, Judge Sleet, that is not a holding. That's dicta in the HAY case. The HAY case did not hold that. What the HAY case said was that the complaint against HAY in that action was not a filing under FEFCHA. It was, in fact, a complaint. It was an action on a judgment. And that action was barred by the five-year statute of limitations in 95.112A. The statement in HAY that's based on the fourth district's opinion in Michael v. Valley Trucking is not a holding at all. It's just a statement. And if you read the fourth district's opinion in Michael v. Valley Trucking, upon which HAY is supposedly based, what Michael says is, after the judgment has been recorded or registered under FEFCHA, it's subject to Florida law. It's subject to Florida lien laws. And what Michael Court says is the difference between the action on a judgment and the filing under FEFCHA is that you don't get a new judgment with a new 20 years. What you get is a judgment with the remainder of 20 years measured from the date that your judgment was originally entered in the rendering jurisdiction. That's what Michael says. Also, I believe that the appellant asserted and the trial court also cited the case, the fourth district case of the tax commissioner of New York v. Friona, which also has odd language in it. And that's not a holding either. The language in that case is the statute of limitations for a FEFCHA judgment is 20 years or the statute of limitations in the rendering jurisdiction, whichever is shorter. 
That, that statement, which is not a holding, it's merely dicta in that case, came out of thin air. Uh, as I indicated, I think I, uh, the Hesses went through a pretty thorough analysis of the cases that Friona and Hay supposedly relied on, and none of those cases support that dicta. So what we have is conflicting dicta before the first district case. We have conflicting dicta in the Florida state courts. Michael says, once you've got your judgment, then Florida statutes apply, including, it, they, Michael, it, it wasn't an issue in that case, so Michael didn't hold that uh, the 20-year statute under 95.11 subsection one applied. What Michael said is, and as this court said in dollar savings, once you've registered your FEFCHA, because of the plain wording of the statute, you must enforce this judgment as if it had been entered by a Florida court. Both this court in Dollar Savings and the fourth district in Michael Truck, uh, versus Valley Trucking said, okay, once you've got your judgment under FEFTA, you're applying Florida statutes. In I, I have an appreciation, a significant appreciation for your position on this. The difficulty I'm having, I think the appellee makes a pretty good argument of trying to interpret and give meaning to Section 55.5024 and how that ties in. And that, as far as a timing situation, that seems to me to be a more specific statute than 55.503. It does say nothing will be uh, construed to extend the limitation period applicable for enforcement of foreign judgments. Why is it not a reasonable interpretation to say that the limitation period in uh, Arizona is five years unless it's renewed and then you get an extra five years. They didn't renew it and therefore the first five year period is, is controlling. For two reasons. First, there's the plain wording and, of- And by the way, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. You didn't reserve time for rebuttal and I'll give you a little bit of extra time, but how much do you want to reserve? I'd You're like, at the 15 minute mark now. I'd like uh, two minutes for rebuttal, Your Honor. To answer your question, there, there are two reasons why. Um, the only courts that have, and I'm not going to say construed 55.5024 because it hasn't been specifically construed yet in a case where that was the issue in the case. But the court that has commented on what that means, the fourth district, in both the Mooka case and the Bershon case, both interpreted the non-uniform statute to refer to the five-year statute of limitations uh, for the, for the uh, common law action uh, for the enforcement of foreign judgments referenced just two subsections above it. If you look in both of those cases, MUCA and Bershon, you can see that that's what the court is interpreting that statute to mean. No Florida state court has ever interpreted uh, the non-uniform statute to refer to any statute of limitations other than Florida's five-year statute of limitations under 95.2a. There was a federal court bankruptcy decision in Ray Tranter that came out of the, South, uh, the Southern District, I think in 2000. It's the only Florida court that has ever said what that means. It's referring to the statute of limitations in the rendering jurisdiction. Since what, then- One of the reasons I'm finding that argument somewhat appealing is this all flows from full faith and credit. And so if a judgment is no longer entitled to full faith and credit because it is gone in the original forum state, why should it be interpreted the way you're suggesting that Florida using this act gives it new vitality when the originating state does not. That would, be, that would be a true argument if we were right now trying to register this judgment under FETCHA. Full, it wouldn't be entitled to full faith and credit, so we wouldn't be able to register it under the Act because registration depends on the judgments being entitled to full faith and credit. However, but what, what, what would the meaning, I'm trying to reconcile the existence of that sentence and give sort of um, scholarly meaning to the fact that you can have an original action in Florida to enforce a judgment and you can re record and enforce the judgment. And so how that would tie in to, to still make 
the uh, filing of the action, that more significant, more impactful proceeding for purposes of longevity. Uh, I, I guess I didn't explain that very, very clearly. With an action on a judgment, if the Hesses had brought a timely action on a judgment, they would have had 20 years in which... No, and I understand. They can pursue either remedy. Right. And the remedies the are different. And the remedies are different. And the consequences are different. But if, you, if within the first year of the existence of a foreign judgment, a party says, okay, what is going to give me the best opportunity to collect for as long as it takes, isn't it the recording, or, or not the recording, but the actual new action? Well, but, but that's the point of keeping the common law action and the statutory action. The statutory action is a lot quicker, cleaner, cheaper. If and you're you, only your talking- argument, Your position seems to conflate the two very, very heavily. And I'm not sure that, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure ultimately how I feel about this because I think it is a very interesting case and you've both made excellent arguments, but your position seems to conflate the two much more than the appellee's position. Well, I think only if you're looking in this case where the recording of the judgment was only three years out from the entry of the judgment in Arizona. If you've got a case where, uh, like the example I used, where your judgment was entered a pretty long time ago and you're left with not very much time on the back end to enforce it in Florida, you're gonna go for that new 20 years because that's gonna give you, just as you were saying, that's gonna give you the best remedy. In this case, there really wasn't that much different. In other cases, there could be a lot of difference where, where the common law judgment is really going to be your best bet and because it gives you more time. Your two minutes for rebuttal now. I'm going to take one more. I'm going to take one more minute out because if I'm not making my point now, I'm not going to make it on the back end. Um, the, 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 the trial court's ruling limits the directive that this court has found in dollar savings to be literal, that a, that, a court, that a judgment registered under FEFCA is to be treated as if it was a judgment of a Florida court. If the legislature had wanted to make an exception, like Washington did, it could have done that, but it hasn't. And I want to go back to the point that no Florida state court has interpreted the, uh, the non-uniform uh, section in a way that the trial court did. In fact, it interpreted in the way where it, it was, it refers to the five-year statute of limitations for the common law action on a judgment. Thank you. Good, mo <clears throat> Good morning, Your Honors. I'm Robert Donald. Fort Myers, and I'm here on behalf of your appellee, uh, John Patrick. Uh, I, I can see that the court knows the relevant cases here, and I'm going to get to the Desert Palace case in a bit. But may, I'd like to start by coming at this from sort of a different direction to set up what I think the issue is. This appeal obviously presents some knotty problems. Uh, there's statutory interpretation going on, as we can see from your examination of Ms. Worthington. There's conflict of law issues, and there's a number of statutes involved in Florida as well as statutes in Arizona. Uh, there's several decisions in this area that y'all have discussed that, uh, in some respects, are conflicting. And well, let, let me give you one thought, if you can take a look at this. It would be easy to reverse this case and say that 555031, which says the judgment shall be enforced as a judgment of a circular county court. And under Chapter 55 and other statutes, we know it becomes a lien on real property for a period of 20 years. So it would be, it would be pretty easy to just say that's what it is. And many of the arguments that Ms. Worthington posits you know, is supportable. Uh, the real question becomes one of intent and legislative intent, and how do we discern that from, as you all are presenting it, a statute that is not clearly worded for this circumstance? Okay, there was a question. That's, there. A, there's, that's a long question. <laughs> I mean, that really it started with thing. what, I but, think. But something. I'm trying to figure out. 55-5024. Let me just tell you, I've, I came into this case 
believing that the recordation does exactly what Ms. Worthington says it does, that it becomes enforceable as a Florida judgment as if it were a Florida judgment. I think you've made some really interesting and, and, and well thought out points as far as that isn't, excuse me, that isn't really what the statute does. And I'm, I'm having a hard time reconciling those two positions with the cases and with the, the wording of the statutes. Okay. So I'm throwing uh, my hands up, Mr. Donovan. Going back to your original question, would it be easy to reverse this case on the basis of uh, the statute Ms. Worthington refers to? The problem with that is what she doesn't take into account is 55.5024 as well as a fair amount of law. Remember, this is a uniform act. So there's law on this from all over the nation as well as on Florida law. Let me try to set up where I think we disagree. What we agree on is this, that in 2003, they obtained a judgment against, a money judgment against Dr. Patrick out in Arizona. They did a UEFJA, and maybe that shows our disagreement. She calls it FIFJA, I'm calling it UEFJA, but it's the same thing, registration in Florida in 2006. 2008, Arizona's five-year limitation on enforcement of judgments expired. They did not renew the judgment as they could have done, and it cannot be renewed now. We all agree on that. I think up to this point, we're all in agreement. Uh, in 2012, they moved for execution in Florida. Now, we're, we're four years past 2008 when they could not have obtained execution in Arizona. So it boils down to this, at the time they did the registration in Florida, it was still an enforceable judgment in Arizona. The problem is it then became unenforceable in Arizona after they did the registration. In this so case- To really sort of summarize what I think the ultimate position that you have is, you have to maintain the viability of the judgment in the originating state no matter what, if you want to enforce it in exactly. another state under the Foreign Recording Act. The registration does not make it a non-Arizona judgment. It's still an Arizona judgment that's being enforced in Florida, subject to the laws of Arizona. So using the five-year period for Arizona, in the fourth year and 11th month, if they found the assets in Florida for the debtor, they really couldn't effectively use the uh, Enforcement Act, unless they also renew the judgment. In they Arizona. could either use, they could renew the judgment or bring an action so, on the judgment. Sure, but we don't have the separate. I know. Action. I mean, they but, could have done either one of those things. But if they've determined there are no longer any assets in Arizona, and now we know there are assets in Florida, if they don't learn this till the fourth month, fourth year, eleventh month they still have to renew, the, ultimately your position is they have to renew the Arizona judgment or else they risk losing enforceability. Or bring an action on a judgment in Florida. You can bring an action on a judgment and thereby, because an action on a judgment makes the foreign judgment the cause of action. You have a civil proceeding with all the trappings of a civil proceeding that results in a Florida judgment and a merger. So the Arizona judgment goes away. You now have a Florida judgment. But it's interesting that subsection four talks about not modifying the limitation period. It doesn't talk about the enforceability of the already existing judgment, whereas 55503 does by saying, okay, now it's enforceable as a Florida judgment. Did you say it does not refer to enforceability? Yes. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'll quote you 55.5024. Nothing in Florida's version of UEFJA, quote, shall be construed to alter, modify, or extend the limitation period applicable for the enforcement of foreign judgments. But in judgments. terms of the limitation period, it doesn't talk about viability of, or maintaining the original judgment. I mean, I understand your interpretation is well implicit in it, it does. And, I, and you're correct, I used the word enforcement. I should have used the word viability. Okay, uh, it doesn't refer to viability, it does refer to enforcement. 
But if I, I, I want to try to get to where I think the cutting edge of this case is. And as we, this is not a simple case. I'm not saying we get to there and we win, but I'm saying this is the issue you guys have to deal with. We all agree that at the time they do the UEFJA registration, it has to be valid in the state where it was issued, or where, yeah, the, the issuing state this being Arizona. We agree on that, okay? I hear today from Ms. Worthington a slightly altered version of that. I thought they agreed that it had to be valid under, still valid under Arizona law. She now says it's the 20 year Florida statute that relates to the Arizona judgment and says when you can do the UEFJA registration. I think that's a new argument. From what I understood, they were in agreement with us in the, the fourth DCA cases, MUCA and those, say that it's got to be valid under the limitations period of the issuing state, not Florida, the issuing state. Okay, and I thought we agreed on that. Where we disagree is once you have a UEFJA registration, what controls as to how long that foreign judgment is enforceable? That's, that's the problem here, okay? It's not when it's filed, it's what controls after it is registered here in Florida. What limitations period do you use? And there's got to be some distinctions here because otherwise you make 9511 itself irrelevant. Remember, 9511 draws a distinction between a foreign judgment and a Florida judgment, okay? Uh, to bring an action on a judge, a Florida judgment is 20 years, on a foreign judgment is five years. They say it's 20 years for a foreign judgment too. Well, if that's so, then 9511 is all wrong because 9511 makes a distinction between Florida and, and, and foreign judgments. Uh, so, we got 555024 that says we don't mean to change any limitations periods by enacting this thing. So, what are the limitations period for enforcement of a judgment that has been registered under FIFJA or UHJA, whichever you want to call it? My unsatisfying answer is it depends. There's two ways to enforce a judgment under UEFJA as we've discussed here. You can bring an action on a judgment in which case you've got 20 years to enforce it because you get a Florida judgment. If you do a UEFJA registration though where you still have an Arizona judgment, you don't have any Florida judgment, there's no specific statute of limitations in Florida as to what that registration means, okay? And that sort of makes some sense because it's still an Arizona judgment. It would make sense under choice of law uh, analysis that you would look to the state who issued the judgment and we haven't changed it in Florida by virtue of the registration. We look to the state that issued the judgment. We don't look at Florida statute of limitations. Now, Ms. Worthington makes the point that uh, full faith and credit does not absolutely require that you uh, apply the statute of limitations of the issuing state. That's true. We've admitted that all the way along. They want to make that an argument, but we're not arguing about it. That's exactly right. But it doesn't prohibit a state from going to the issuing state. Here, the issuing state is Arizona. We have the borrowing statute in 9510 that says, essentially, if the statute of limitations in another state applies, then it applies in Florida also to the cause of action. That's sort of a, co uh, a conflict of law statute. And sort of playing about in the back of this thing is conflict of laws issue. And the way we usually avoid conflict of laws in statute of limitations cases is by these borrowing statutes. So we don't get into a dispute as to whether Florida or Arizona law applies. Florida 
leaves the battlefield and says, Arizona law implies, when the cause of action arises in another state. Well, the cause of action is the judgment. It's in Arizona. You've got to look at Arizona law. That's basically our argument here. And there are three or four cases that have pretty much accepted this argument. Uh, there's the N. Ray Tranter case, which is a bankruptcy case. Lord knows why a couple of cases here are bankruptcy cases. Who would think bankruptcy judges would get into this? But apparently they did. Tranter was exactly the same situation as we have here. It was a Kentucky judgment that was registered in Florida under a UEFA. It was valid in Kentucky when it was registered, but it wasn't valid when they went to enforce it in Florida under Kentucky law. The, the federal court looked at the, mainly the fourth DCA case, cases and said, look, it's got to still be valid in Kentucky when you seek to enforce it in Florida because a UEFA registration doesn't create a new judgment. You're talking about the Kentucky judgment here, not the Florida judgment. Uh, there's the Stokely Holdings case, which the trial court mentioned in its judgment from Michigan, dealing with a UEFA registration in Florida. Same circumstances as here, and the Michigan court said it had to be enforceable in Michigan, even though the UEFA re registration was in Florida. Uh, there's a Caldwell Banker case from Arizona that, that holds the same thing. Okay, so there are several cases that have actually looked at this exact scenario that we have under Florida law and have held that in a UEFA registration, since it's not an action on a judgment, you don't get the benefit of having a Florida judgment. Desert Palace, I want to speak to Desert Palace for a moment. Uh, it was a Nevada judgment in 1991, and the UEFA registration was in 2001, and the trial court uh, dismissed it. The first DCA, and this is odd what the first DCA did here, the first DCA said you have 20 years to bring the action, okay? And perhaps this is where Miss Worthington is now getting the, the change of view here about how long you have to bring the action. The Desiree case confuses what Goodwin said, which is Judge Pasquet's bankruptcy case, and applies the t what, what the Goodwin in says is that you have 20 years to enforce it, not 20 years to bring it. Desert Palace gets confused about that and says you have 20 years to bring it, okay? So it sort of confuses the, the issue even further, another reason why this is a difficult area. It relied upon this Goodwin case, which the Goodwin case itself never mentions the uh, uh, non-standard provision in our version of, of UEFA. And it says that the Foreign Country Judgments Act is, in, for policy reasons, practically identical to UEFA. And that is just plain wrong. I mean, UEFA is founded on full faith and credit. It assumes that the underlying judgments from America, an American jurisdiction where we all pretty much have the same law and are guided by the same United States Constitution. A foreign country judgment is a whole different bird. A foreign country judgment can only be domesticated in Florida or anywhere else by an action on a judgment. You can't just register a foreign country judgment as you can a foreign state judgment under UEFA. And where this comes from is this, under the old version of the Foreign Country uh, Act, a Texas court said that's unconstitutional. You can't just register a judgment from Togo as you can a judgment from Arizona. There's got to be an action on a judgment because who knows what all these people are applying and any of that sort of thing. Also, it would make sense with a foreign country judgment that you not 
utilize their statute of limitations because God knows if they even have a statute of limitations. They don't have the same background in the law that we do. So the, the error of Godwin that has sprung through to Desert Palace is that it equates a foreign country judgment with a foreign state judgment, and that is just plain wrong. The two are totally different, as the case law gathered in the answer brief tells the court. They're, they're different things, and they, you can't apply one to the other without running afoul of some of the basic concepts applying to each one. That being said, if the court has no further questions, I'll uh, sit down and let Ms. Worthington finish up. Thank you, Mr. Long. Thank you, Your Honor. Did you have Did you have About a minute and a half. You have to take it. Uh, I've got three quick points. First of all, uh, UFMRJA does require almost the exact same registration procedure as FEFCHA. If you look at the statute, that's true. Secondly, the Tranter case has been superseded in the Southern District by a case that just came out in April, 645 West 44th Street, that I supplied the court in a notice of supplemental authority. In that case, the Southern District said, once you've registered your judgment, it is uh, subject to the 20-year statute of limitations in Florida. The conflict of law question in this case is resolved by the plain wording of the statute itself, where in 55.5031, the statute clearly says, once you've registered it here, we're going to treat it like a Florida judgment. And the practical reason for that is the, is the, the outcomes that I set out in my reply brief. If you, if you accept the Hess's argument and you, and you subject this judgment and theft of judgments to 20 years. When you, when you go to see if that judgment is enforceable in Florida, you have one step. It's the same step you take if you're going to see if a Florida judgment is enforceable here. You look at the judgment. You see what date it was entered. You see if 20 years have, have gone by, and if they have, it's not enforceable. Under the trial court's interpretation, you've got about seven steps. You look at the judgment. You look at what state it was entered in. You look at that state statute of limitations. If you're past that statute of limitations, you've got to look to see if that state has a renewal procedure. If it does, you've got to see what the renewal procedure is. If they are good with the renewal procedure, but and, and some states have uh, unlimited renewal, so you can be 50 years out sometimes and your, your judgment's still going to be enforceable in its home state. But then you're going to have an argument that's going to come before an appellate court. OK, so now we're 50 years out. Are any Florida statutes of limitations going to apply? Are we now going to apply the 20-year statute of limitations? Thank you, Your Honor. We ask that you reverse the trial court. Thank you.